on the Republican Party and on current President Bush are not meant as general political assaults on conservatism nor on the Republican Party. They are targeted surgical strikes only on the religious right that manifests in that party and that now manifests through President Bush. In fact, as I say when I speak around the United States, the problem is not the Republican Party per se, it is the religious right that dominates that party, and if in fact the Republican Party were to return to its true roots as a party of limited government, it would not accept within its ranks a movement that tries to achieve totalitarian religious controls over the American people. And so it was that toward the end of his career, one of the icons of modern conservative republicanism, the 1964 Republican nominee for president, Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater, condemned the religious right as being in violation of the limited government tenets of the Republican Party. Right now, though there are definitely problems in other countries, we are the only major Western nation to be caught up in not just a religious struggle, as there are many here in Canada, but to be caught up in a massive fundamentalist religious movement as embodied by the religious right and evangelical Christian voters who constitute about one-third of the presidential electorate. After the 2004 election, a poll showed that of all those who voted for president that year, 21% only were concerned about the economy, but 22%, a whole percentage more of the American voters, were concerned about prohibiting same-sex marriage. When a greater percentage, even if it's just by 1%, of American presidential voters are more concerned about oppressing gays and lesbians than about their own economic well-being, we have the symptoms of a pervasive religious preoccupation in what should easily be one of the, if not the most modern, of civilizations. The symptoms of fundamentalism are rather clear, claiming one true faith and a willingness to impose that faith on others, intolerance of dissent, and justification through a claim that the scripture is without error to impose views on all of society. The Republican Party did not become the captive of the religious right until the 1980 election cycle. In fact, in 1976, Ronald Reagan tried to topple incumbent Republican Gerald Ford for the Republican renomination by attacking President Ford from the religious right, but failed. What happened, as best as we can understand, was that Reagan, the consummate actor, won over the religious right operatives in 1979. Supposedly, he and former Texas Governor John Conley a Democrat who later became a Republican, and John Conley will go down in history as the person who was also struck by the same bullets but survived that killed President Kennedy on November 22, 1963, in Dallas, Texas. They were both given an opportunity to say what they would say to God at the Judgment Day. And Governor Conley talked about being a good person and how his father was a good Methodist. But Ronald Reagan said he would say nothing to God on the Judgment Day and looked down at the floor and said he would just throw himself on the mercy of what Christ did for him and everyone else at Calvary. And that is what sealed the deal and the emerging religious right wing unified behind Ronald Reagan. And so it was during the 1980 election cycle where Ronald Reagan appearing at a group of fundamentalist ministers in Dallas, Texas said, you may not be able to endorse me, but I endorse you. Now in office, President Reagan did what he could to try to make America a theocracy. In 1987, he tried to put a true totalitarian, Robert Bork, on the Supreme Court, but thankfully Bork was defeated. Bork believed that 
even free speech did not apply outside of political campaigns, and otherwise the government could censor. On March 15, 1982, <coughs> President Reagan, speaking to the Alabama legislature, said, and I quote, Sometimes I can't help but feel that the First Amendment is being turned on its head. The First Amendment was not written to protect the people of this country from religious values. It was written to protect religious values from government tyranny. Does that mean that government can impose religion on everyone? On August 23, 1984, speaking in Dallas, Texas, Governor uh, President Reagan said, America needs God more than God needs America. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. Does that mean that people who don't believe in God are not citizens, are not accepted? I don't think that President Reagan, in to be charitable his intellectual innocence, had any idea of how devastating the implications of these comments were. The Texas Republican Party in 2004 affirmed that the United States is, is a specifically Christian nation, called church-state separation a myth, and called for abstinence-only education instead of sex education, informing young people of modern contraceptive options. Moderate Republican Congress member Christopher Shays has said that the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln has become the party of theocracy. While meeting with the Pope in June of 2004, President Bush asked the Vatican to push American bishops to be more aggressive in religious issues like abortion and in support for a constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage. On July 16, 2004, the President said in Lancaster, Pennsylvania to an Amish crowd, I trust that God speaks through me Without that, I couldn't do my job. It's a bit frightening when the leader of the most powerful nation on earth thinks he is channeling the deity. And I think that should be a cause of concern for everyone around the globe. The president's inaugural prayer lunch, when he first assumed office in January of 2001, was hosted by Reverend Sung Young Moon, a theocratic leader of an extreme version of Christianity who claims he is the modern incarnation of Jesus. If we lose government neutrality on matters of religion, we will face government efforts to control issues of birth, life, death, sex, health, marriage, medicine, and the role of the family. These endless disputes will mire the United States in a virtual, if not an overt, religious war. Not only will women lose the right to safe and legal abortion if a religious right winger replaces Justice Stevens, even the right of people married to each other to use birth control could be nullified because the 1965 case of Griswold versus Connecticut, which said that the right of privacy covers the right of married couples to use birth control, has been considered to be wrongly decided by extreme television preacher Pat Robertson, who has been a major player in determining the most recent appointees to the Supreme Court. We would also even lose the morning after pill. Moreover, when John Ashcroft, President Bush's first Attorney General, was still in the Congress, he authored, but thankfully lost his effort to have the United States Constitution Amendment put into the very Constitution itself, declaring that life begins at fertilization, which would ban abortion and many modern means of birth control. Public schools and textbooks would be pressured toward official prayer and theological correctness in matters ranging from science and evolution to sex education and family life. One of the true founding fathers of the American religious right wing was the Reverend Jerry Falwell, who died last year. And he wrote, In America Can Be Saved, and this is a quote, I hope I live to see the day when, as in the early days of our country, we won't have any public schools, the churches will have taken them over again, and Christians will be running them. We will also forfeit our leading role in biological science by denying our public school children a clear understanding of evolution, because we are one vote away on the United States Supreme Court from overturning all the decisions 
that prevent creationism and creationism dressed up in the fancy costume of intelligent design from being taught in the public schools. One vote away on the Supreme Court from creationism being allowed to be taught by the states in the public schools. We will also forfeit any leading role in modern biological sciences because of the religious-based stoppage of stem cell research at the national level. In May of 2001, President Bush withdrew all funding for stem cell research, prompting former Republican United States Senator John Danforth of Missouri, an ordained Episcopalian minister, to claim that the religious mandate to heal the sick is being violated by President Bush's edict. An interesting slant on that. Though the California Supreme Court has ruled under the state constitution and didn't invoke the United States Constitution so as to shield its opinion from review by the United States Supreme Court, that persons of the same sex may marry there is a ballot initiative in California which, if passed by the voters, could amend the state constitution to overturn the state Supreme Court's opinion and reinstate the ban on same-sex marriage. However, even beyond this, the right of gays and lesbians to engage in private sexual conduct among themselves has only been nationwide protected since 2003. In the case of Lawrence versus Texas, police officers in Texas broke in on an adult male gay couple having sex and arrested them because homosexual conduct was illegal in the state of Texas. By a vote of six to three, the United States Supreme Court said that no state can criminalize private homosexual adult conduct. However, with the replacement of Justice O'Connor by Justice Alito, that majority has dwindled to five to four. By the replacement of Justice Stevens by a religious right-wing justice, that decision would be reversed, and the states would once again be free to criminally punish same-sex sexual love. Now, in his dissent in Lawrence versus Texas, Justice Scalia, in a very frightening way, said that the people of any state should be able to impose their collective sense of sexual morality through the police power of the state. And among the practices he listed as ripe for prohibition by a state legislature was masturbation. Now, how that's going to be enforced is really quite an amazing story. But again, going back to Pat Robertson, who has had an inordinate influence on the Reagan and both Bush administrations. On his 700 Club television show, he once said, many involved with Hitler were Satanists and many were homosexuals. The two things seemed to go together. In the past 10 years, there was a Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court. And in concurring in an opinion that denied a lesbian mother custody of a child, Roy Moore, as the Chief Justice of Alabama, writing officially said, homosexuality is against both natural and revealed law, a detestable and abominable sin. Well, the Chief Justice or a Justice of any state Supreme Court is not supposed to be enforcing revealed law. But then he continued to write, the state carries the power of the sword that is the power to prohibit conduct with physical penalties such as confinement and even execution. It is a very, very tragic occurrence that the Chief Justice of any of the 50 states would refer to execution in the same paragraph in which he condemns homosexuality. It conjures up the frightening mandate in the book of Leviticus of putting to death two men who make love with each other. We will also lose 
modern sex education. Because federal law currently bans any discussion of medical contraception in federally funded sex education programs. In fact, on December 2nd, 2004, the Washington Post reported that many young people in federally funded abstinence-only programs have been taught that abortion leads to sterility and suicide and that half the gay male teenagers in the United States have tested positive for the HIV virus and that even touching a person's private parts can lead to pregnancy. And supposedly for a political party that wants to stay out of people's private lives and have limited government, we see the continued intervention and end-of-life issues characterized by the massive government attempt three years ago to intrude into the privacy of the husband-wife relationship where Mr. Shiaibo was trying to determine what to do with his comatose wife, Terry, where Congress actually attempted to intervene. But we also have a major problem with the funding, actual funding of religious programs. The faith-based initiative of this president is supposed to funnel tax dollars into actual religious programs that are supposed to provide services to the poor and the chemically addicted. And there are no safeguards to make sure that those people don't have to undergo religious proselytization. In January of 2004, President Bush said he wants to fund groups that save Americans one soul at a time. Well, it's not the business of any United States president to save souls. Once the president held up a Bible calling it the handbook for the faith-based operation. Speaking at a Dallas, Texas church in 2003, President Bush remarked, People need to know a higher power that is bigger than their problems. What the faith-based program says time after time is that miracles are possible. Well, that is not the business of the president to usher in religious miracles with public funds. And to show you how corrupt this is, a minister in Philadelphia piped in to the 2004 Republican National Convention an endorsement of President Bush, and within a month was awarded a $1 million federal grant for his drug rehabilitation program. Also, the faith-based initiative, not only does it exclude non-believers, it excludes alternative religions. Steve Goldsmith, the former mayor of Indianapolis, was the initial special advisor to the president on faith-based initiatives. And he said on February 2nd, 2001, that Wiccan groups would not qualify. But the faith-based initiative causes even more damage. In 2003, a shelter for homeless veterans in Northampton, Massachusetts, lost a third of its funding after the money was diverted to faith-based groups. And the shelter had a long history of pro providing services to veterans, and the faith-based groups did not. There has also been an effort at censorship. Efforts across the country to get public schools and libraries not to carry the Harry Potter series. And in fact, the current Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, remarked when he was still Cardinal Ratzinger that the Potter books erode Christianity in the soul of young people. There were efforts to ban the Impressions reading series in the 80s and early 90s claiming they promoted witchcraft. In fact, a story that mentioned a witch riding a broom was attacked by the religious right as encouraging masturbation. <laughs> In 1993, the Kansas School Board removed a teen novel, Annie on My Mind, from school libraries because it deals with homosexuality. And parents had to sue in federal court to have the teen novel reinstated. But yet, if the Supreme Court falls to the religious right, such lawsuits would fail and such censorship would prevail. 
I think that the person who worded this problem the best was former New York Governor Mario Cuomo when he said it was rank hypocrisy for the religious right to lecture the American people on limited government and then to turn around and try to tell us, the people of the United States, what God to believe in and how to apply the judgment of that God to our bodies and to our bedrooms. And so, as you watch the spectacle of the elections unfold to the south of you, understand what is at stake in terms of secular government. Now, what can you do in Canada? Well, contrary to the joke pervading California, I did not come here trying to register Democrats for the fall election. <laughs> but I did come here trying to urge you to help build and support the Center for Inquiry in Canada. You have problems here. There are efforts to give some religions special considerations. There is the ongoing dispute about the funding of Catholic schools in this province. There are religious people who, while they may not manifest the extreme fundamentalism, still want religion ensconced in government, declare the supremacy of God in all matters. And you will have to be active in this nation as we have to be active in the United States. And the Center for Inquiry is the best vehicle for doing that. And we ask you to support with your money and your time our organizations, the Center for Inquiry branches here in Canada. Because this country, with its high level of civilization and intellectual acuity, is a wonderful testing ground for purely secular government. And just in case in the United States we fail, and just in case the Supreme Court falls to the religious right and we become a theocracy because of our legal system, that doesn't mean that you can't hold the line here in Canada. If that big bruising neighbor to the south gets hobbled by a theocratic government, that doesn't have to spill over to the north. Whatever happens to us in the United States, you humanists here in Canada can still lead the way to a modern secular civilization. This country has the intellectual depth, this country has the culture and the civilization to eventually separate God and government and to preserve equal liberty for all. And all I would ask is that in the event that things go very badly for non-believers and secularists in the United States, just keep in the back of your minds that I might come to you and ask your help at some point in the future for one of my trips to Canada to be a little more permanent. Thank you very much.